Anyway, how many of you took the plant walk this morning with me? How many of you remember the jokes I said? <laughs> Very good. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about me for those of you who don't know. My name is Daryl Patton. I go by the moniker the Southern Herbalist. And I've been working with medicinal plants for about 32 years now. And I was fortunate to study with an old man named Tommy Bass who gathered medicinal plants for 81 years in the Southern Appalachians and was an amazing resource for medicinal plants. And so my passion in life is to pass this knowledge down to you because there are a lot of herb stores, nothing wrong with them, a lot of herbalists, nothing wrong with them, but there are not a lot of herbalists who know the plants out where God has put them. And I believe it's important if you want to be an herbalist or a homesteader who uses herbs to know the plants because what happens if the North Koreans nuke us, you're not going to have an herb store. What happens if health care gets too expensive, can't afford it, you have the woods. Tommy, when he was born in 1908, was born into a sharecropper family. And as he often told me, if there had been welfare back then, they'd have had to borrow money to get on it. They were that dirt poor. And so for them, going to the woods, going to the fields, was not something, a trip you went to go get something special. It was if you needed yellow dock, go get some yellow dock. And you went to where the yellow dock was. There was nothing special about it. It was just common, everyday knowledge among the people of that day. In fact, how many of you have ever eaten Pope salad? A few of you still, you know, and go back a couple of generations, everybody ate Pope salad. But we have become afraid of nature, in my opinion. We're afraid to go out and forage plants because people think that they'll poison themselves. Odds are extremely low that you will. About nine cases a year of poisoning from foraging that are serious enough to require hospitalization. Seven are by mushrooms, two of them by plants. Usually it's poke salad or something that they didn't wash the, phytolac the what are called phytolacotoxins out and they got real sick, went to the hospital, you know, wish they had never eaten it and probably will never eat it again. But actually, it's actually very, very safe to gather wild foods. And by incorporating wild foods into your diet, you're doing two things. You're adding a lot of variety to your diet because many of these wild foods are very, very nutritious. They're very edibly tasty. They're not just green tasting. And they're also extremely rich in vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals that can heal you. Now, since we're at a homesteaders conference, everybody should be able to answer this question positively. How many of you grow a garden? All right. You may not have wished you raised your hand. How many of you have grown a tomato plant? Okay. You did, now, I know you raised your hand. Did you raise your hand? Good. So I'll pick on him since you have the camera. Are, are, you know what a tomato plant looks like, right? Are you positive? Okay, I've never seen a tomato plant in my life. Describe one to me and tell me what it looks like. Oh, you're talking about a potato plant. Very similar. Uh huh. How do you know it's a tomato plant, not a potato plant? Oh, what's a tomato look like? Oh, like an apple. Like a large apple. Oh, okay. So you're talking about an apple tree. But on a potato plant. On a potato plant. <laughs> now, yeah. that's called circular reasoning, and I can keep it up for hours because there is no way to get out of that trap. However, everybody here that has, at least has, who gardens and has planted tomatoes knows what a tomato plant looks like the very instant you see it, with or without tomatoes on it. Why? Nope, not because you're familiar. Why? What? Nope. But how do you know? How do you know when you see it? I mean, you take a look. You don't have to. You know, it's like looking at a rattlesnake. You don't have to decide if it has rattlers on it or not. You know, it's a rattlesnake. Nope. Nope. They all play a part. But the reason you know a tomato plant when you see it is for one simple reason. Go to Walmart in February and buy a tomato and eat it. What will it taste like? Cardboard. Now, in July, go get a tomato warm and ripe out of your garden and take a big old juicy bite out of it. What does it taste like? Heaven. 
The closest I can ever become to becoming a vegetarian, as long as there's some meat thrown in with it, would be about July. You've got all of those great garden plants coming in. But you know it because it fills your belly, makes your taste buds happy. It's because you have a use for it. That's why you know a tomato plant when you see it. However, if you take a look at this little vine, grows all over the place here that you probably have never noticed, called cross vine. You have no use for it, so you have no reason to really remember it easily. Once you find out that, hey, I can use this with somebody in my family who has had chemo or radiation, and they have no energy, and this will give them energy in about three or four days, and they can get back up and walking again, then you have a reason to store it in your subconscious mind and bring that information back. I have an herb school where I teach herbal medicine, and we do math all the time, doing tincture percolations and calculations. And when I was in high school, I did not like math. I couldn't tell you what kind of algebra I took in ninth grade math because I was just chasing a girl. That's the only reason I took that class. However, you ask me about geography or history or government, things, topics I absolutely loved, and I can throw you facts out all day long because I valued that knowledge and I have a reason to be able to pull it back out. But that algebra, unless I self-destructed it, is still back in the brain. I just didn't have a reason to bring it back out. So once you find out that you got a kid that's got the croup in chestnut leaves, chestnut from a Chinese chestnut or an American chestnut or a chinkapin will help with that croup, now you, re you realize, hey, this is something useful to me to know what it looks like going outside. So my goal with, with teaching plants is teach you how to value them because they're not anything, well, they are special in a sense, but they're not anything special in that it's very hard to work with them. And so I wanted to show you a few plants today and talk about them. And I'm actually going to make you some pancakes for those of you who want to try a wild food pancake that is really, really good. We'll talk about it after a while. And somebody needs to tell me when to be quiet because I lose track of time. I have no idea. I just know I don't have enough, so I'm speaking fast. But anyway, when I first started doing this, I'd go up to old Tommy Bass's house with a big old sack of plants he'd identify for me. And then as time went by, I started learning, you know, you can experiment. And so I developed some, some rules that I teach that apply to both herbal medicine and also to wild foods. And... When it comes to wild foods or herbal medicine, A, the plant needs to be easy enough to identify that you feel safe in picking it because everybody's scared to death they're going to poison themselves, which is not going to happen. B, it needs to provide more calories than it takes to get something out of it. You'll see a wild food book have be about that thick, 900 plants, and 880 of them you'll spend 1,000 calories to gain 50 calories. In my book, that is not worth the effort. Other than as a trailside nibble, say you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. However, you take things like acorns, yellow dock. Those are things that you can gather in a short period of time, tons and tons of calories of food, easy to be stored, which is another one of my rules, and it'll last all winter till the next harvest comes in, which is another rule you go by. You know, if it's going to go bad on you, it's not worth gathering. And when you learn some of these rules, you realize, hey, I have a whole world open to me because we're in Virginia. Without knowing, I would estimate it's probably like Alabama with about 3,000 species of flowering plants. That doesn't count your trees, your lichen, or your fungi, all of which are also medicinal and some are edible. And so you will always be a student if you, get, if you delve into this. And one of the really important parts to this is that when you use them as wild foods is you want to have a plant that either tastes good on its own or can be utilized in dishes that will make it taste good. So, you know, once you learn a few of those rules and apply them, it's very easy to you know, I couldn't go hungry if, I, if the world came to an end. I couldn't go hungry. I know too many plants. And, as, and if you look back, and I'm, you may laugh if I walk right off this thing because it, it's liable. But in the mid-1980s is when all the survival books really took off. And, in, and that was because Tom Brown got on The Tonight Show, which was, you know, the uh, Facebook of the day was The Tonight Show. If you got on that, you wrote your ticket. 
And everything was hunt, trap, fish, fish, trap, 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 hunt, fish, trap. Very little on plants. And oh my God, don't ever touch a mushroom. You'll poison yourself looking at them. There's no food value in them. You're liable to poison yourself. There's no medicinal value in them. Stay away from them. And that's because people had these blinders on. Mushrooms, um, for example, if your ancestors are from England, Scotland, Ireland, or Wales, raise your hand. All right. You are mushroom phobic. In English culture, mushrooms were associated with witches. You look at the old fairy tales, big old toadstool, which was an Amanita muscaria. They've got this red with the freckles on it. Very good medicinal mushroom, by the way. And it, it, one dose of it, you can knock sciatica out completely. Also edible if you peel the cap and cook it right. Hallucinogenic if you want to get high on it. And um, people there couldn't read, couldn't write. So what do you do? You teach your kids. You teach your kids that if you get near that mushroom, that witch is going to jump out, grind your bones into flour, and eat you, bake you in an oven. And if you ever want to read something really entertaining, is skip the American version of the Grim Fairy Tales and get the European version. They, are, they will put Stephen King to having nightmares. They are terrible. But they were meant because in that day and age, if you were a kid and you got kidnapped, they'd never see you again. So you were taught these things to keep you safe. And we brought that mushroom phobia over with us. So unless you're from France, Germany, and some other places where they liked mushrooms, we bring that fear, and it's an unfounded fear. But let me show you a few plants that I was talking about earlier. And actually, what you need to do, by the way, I'm going to do a couple of giveaways. Uh, if you take a piece of paper and just write your name on it, if you don't have paper, a $20 bill works well. <laughs> the higher the denomination goes, the higher your odds of winning. But just write your name on a piece of paper, on a piece of paper fold it up. Don't do it on pink or green paper because I'm going to close my eyes. And I'm going to give a couple of things away. But I was talking earlier about cross vine. In April, as you drive down the sides of the road, you're going to see this beautiful ever, semi-evergreen vine, and it'll have clusters of red blooms that look like tubes with yellow lips. That is cross vine. If you will pass these around and you can look at them, take some if you want to keep it. And you'll, you'll notice on the stem that, it's, that it is two leaves across from two leaves. So I'll throw them out to you. Hey, I feel like I'm on a Mardi Gras float. Huck. Try that. And that's how I got the name Cross Vine. And I saw the story this morning. I had a, a lady, yeah, this is past brand, if, had a lady that contacted me. Her husband had had chemo and radiation, mid-70s, 80-ish maybe. And she said, what can you do for him? You know, he, he, all he does is sit in his easy chair because he has no energy. Sent some of the cross vine up. And about a week later, I had an email from her saying, thank you for giving me my husband back. He's out in the garden. I ran into him a few months later at a program. And he said, I drink about half a cup a day. Good to go. And what it does is back in the 30s and 40s and when people still plowed with horses and mules, they had a condition called hidebound. And basically, they worked them to death. So the kidneys would shut down, toxins would build up, the horse would lose its hair, meat would stick to the flesh would stick to the bone, and the animal was on its way out. So they would give them a, an herb called pipsisawa or rat's vein, which opened up and flushed toxins out through the kidneys, and they'd give them cross vine for energy. Three days later, the horse would be plowing, plowing again. So Tommy was smart and figured, well, if it's good for a horse, it's good for man. And in general, except for cats, which are wonky about, about medicines of any sort, you can go by body weight with animals and kids and adults. And so he would start using it with people, and they realized three or four days later, you, man, I feel, I feel like I've got some stamina, some energy. may not want to run a marathon, but you feel better. And at one point in time, a few years back, one of the, a student from Bastyr University, which is a huge naturopathic university out west, came down, and I showed him Crossvine. He took some back received permission to do gas and liquid chromatography on it because he was a graduate student in the lab and discovered it contained a chemical called rawolfia. Rawolfia is also present in 
not Rawolfia, Reserpine, which is present Rawolfia from India, but it's a very toxic medicine used for kidney ailments and as an antipsychotic. This contains trace amounts just enough for the body to stimulate healing. So to give you an example of that is here you are trotting down the trail, scared to death that something's going to jump out and get you. You look down and there's a rattlesnake. What, and you know this is a trick question, but what's the first thing that you do? What? Scream? No. 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 Now I grab them and pick them up. Before that, you immediately secrete a chemical called adrenaline. Every ambulance in the country, every ER has adrenaline as a prescription controlled medicine, also known as epinephrine. That is your fight or flight syndrome. So you're walking down there. There's the rattlesnake. And for some people, it could, it could be a garter snake or a little tiny worm snake. And you look at it and you go, Ooh. I'm not boo-booing. Ooh. Body, secrete adrenaline. Doesn't work that way, does it? You have that mind-body connection that your sympathetic nervous system, your autonomic nervous system immediately makes medicine. So your body has that ability to make its own medicine in many cases. And sometimes all it needs is that tiny little stimulus. When I was going to school, I worked at a detention center, and I had kids from murder to you name it there, and someone would go be going off the wall, just tearing things up. We'd give them a sugar pill. Now, you need to go sit down because in a few minutes, this stuff's going to really make you sleepy. You know, this is a strong sleeping pill. Five minutes later, <laughs> sound asleep because their mind accepted the fact that this was medicine and their body produced that sedation. My, I do medical hypnosis also, and that is a big key when we do hypnosis, is getting if the mind can accept it, the body will follow. And so you get those little trace elements of some of these things, and it'll achieve that purpose. Now, you do have to be careful with this. I was doing a, a plant walk with Clayton College when I was worked with him, and a friend of mine, if, you've ever, if you know of Matthew Wood, who's a very well-known herbalist up north, and he was down, and I showed him cross finding down, down in, near Atlanta, and he picked a flower and chewed on it and said, wow, this is good stuff. I could really feel the, the, the difference. And I thought, wow, that's fast. Never heard of that. He said, but it's strange. It's giving me this weird body reaction of making my left ankle tingle. Never heard of that. He picked another one. Man, I like this stuff. But now it's making my ankle burn. I looked at him. I looked down. I said, it's because you're in fire ants. <laughs> anyway, really good stuff. How about that? Rabbit tobacco, life everlasting, cudweed. Wonderful, wonderful plant. Different species in this genus grove from Florida to Canada and west to California. Common everywhere in spots. This is traditionally, you go out behind the bar and roll it up in some brown paper sack and smoke it when you can get cigarettes. In fact, I, did I tell a story about my nursing home thing? No, my, my master gardeners. I was doing a program for some master gardeners about this many people, 65 on up the average age. And I said, how many of y'all smoked rabbit tobacco? Oh, yeah, yeah, a bunch of people raised hand. I remember doing that out granddad's barn. If you couldn't get that, how many of you smoked cross-fine cigars? And that's where you'd split these vines down into four pieces and suck your eyeballs out trying to get the smoke through it, but you were cool. Yeah, about six or seven people raised their hand. And I said, when you couldn't get either one of those, how many of y'all smoked pot? People go, and after it was over, an 85-year-old lady came up to me and said, I wanted to raise my hand, but I go to church with so-and-so, and that was 45 years ago. <laughs> anyway, so if you got dry, stuffy sinuses, and that's a true story, too. If you got dry, stuffy sinuses, you can either smoke or you can boil this and inhale the steam, but blow the smoke out your sinuses, and temporarily it'll shrink the mucus tissue back down and dry it up and open your sinuses back up. If you take that same smoke and inhale it in your lungs, it'll cause reflexive spasmodic action of the lungs, and you will <coughs> all of it out real fast. When my son was seven, he said, Daddy, I want to learn how to smoke. I looked at him, I said, okay. Got a corn cob pipe, filled it full of this. It looked like lava glowing, it was so hot. And I said, when I hit three, inhale as deeply as you can. He never smoked again. Chewed for a while, but never smoked. <laughs> but it actually smells quite good. And it's very good for lung conditions. And one of the things it does, if you use it in a liquid form, 
it does not cause that spasmodic action. It, it acts as an expectorant, but it also shuts off the production of mucus. So you start talking about herbs that dry the lungs or dry this out. They don't necessarily, in most cases, dry them like a sponge. They shut the production of more mucus off. So as you get the phlegm up and out, you, I am going to watch it. You're going you're gonna to not produce more mucus. Excellent. But what I like even more about this is this is not known for this, but this is one of my favorite respiratory antivirals. It's very high in what are called terpenes, monoterpenes, diterpenes, sesquiterpenes, triterpenes, very powerful antivirals, for specifically for respiratory viruses. And you'll hear this a lot in, in talks and herb books where this thing says it has an affinity for, and some herbs, and just like antibiotics, have, a, have an affinity for certain conditions they work on. And this will, is specific to respiratory viruses, colds, flus, viral pneumonia, not, I wouldn't use it necessarily for shingles. What was it called? Call, call, what was it called? Rabbit tobacco. If you look it up in the books, the botanical name is Nephalium obtusifolium or Pseudonephalium obtusifolium are the two main varieties. You can't tell them apart unless you uh, botanist and key them out. But we'll pass it around. Just, you can open it up and spread it. Help yourself to these. I have wads of this stuff. Oops. Yes, you can make sage bundles out of it. It has a different odor, but it's a pleasant odor. And those, and those terpenes. Wait, and you think about it. What is one of the fastest ways of getting medicine in you? Through your olfactory system. You inhale it. Yes. No, not as a smoke, and as a tea, because it's like asthma. You don't want to stop spas You don't want to start spasming of the lungs. Liquid, liquid's fine, no problem at all using it for that. It's like for asthmatics, you would not use this or you'll, you'll make it worse. There, there are many other things like yellow plum bark, the syrup, etc. Or jimson weed is another one that, that works real well for asthma. One or two puffs of that, it does not get you high, but it'll immediately stop the spasmodic action of the wheezing, etc. But help yourself to it. Now, when you harvest this, during the spring when, and summer, when most people can't identify because it blends in with everything, the top of the leaves will be green, underneath will be a, a white, silvery white. As they mature in the fall, from the base up, they start to turn brown on top, white on the bottom. That's when you start harvesting those because that's when the terpene contents are at their highest. Also good for poison ivy, poison oak, and salve as well. Good for healing wounds. Okay. Now this one's getting puny, but we'll get, we'll actually, but it'll come back if you want to. Yeah, I'm going to give this one away, and we'll do a drawing for it. This is Solomon Seal. Now, if you look at Gerard's writings in the in the late Middle Ages, he wrote that Solomon Seal is most excellent for for strong-willed women who run into their husband's fists. In other words, it was good for the bruising when you got socked, because you know rougher era. But it was good for bruising, but it was mainly used for women who had had babies and their pelvic region had been stretched and the tendons and ligaments were stretched, torn, and bruised. It heals them and brings them back into condition. I use it with anybody that's got any kind of sports type injury, AC, MCLs, torn ligaments, tendons. Use it internally as a tincture and externally in a salve form and it will actually take a lot of the pain out. Very good stuff. The root tastes like a cucumber so you can eat it if you so desire. Don't eat lots or it'll make you throw a kidney stone. But it's a really good medicinal medicinal plant. I use it in some cough medicines because um, sometimes it's people use it for arthritis as well because it lubricates the joints and lubricates the lungs. Ma'am? It depends on what's causing the back issues. Yes, if it involves ligaments, tendons, or muscles. Mm. There are other things I would do for the disc. Uh, I used this recently. I was walking in Publix with my wife, and there was this huge Mexican clay pot. My warning bells did not go off. I bent over. Eh. If it hadn't been for the buggy, I'd have been laying on the ground dialing 922. It, I pulled muscles in my lower back. And this is what got me back on the road in about two weeks. I mean, it was... Oh, it was agony. 
All right, another one here that reminds me of Tommy Bass, because it's one of the first plants he taught me, was it's called yellow root, also known as shrub yellow root, because the further north you go out of Alabama and you hit Tennessee, they, they call golden seal yellow root. Then you got barberry, gold thread, out west, Oregon grape, algerita. So common names will get you in trouble sometimes. And you actually harvest the stems because they're as medicinal as the roots and they don't kill the plant. <clears throat> and as long as you leave the root in the ground, <coughs> excuse me, the plant will keep on spreading. They spread real well. If you take that, sc scrape it, it'll be a yellowish green color, especially when it's fresh. And if you smell it, you will smell the berberine in it. In fact, Tommy Bass got one visit from the FDA in his whole 81 years of doing this, and so I don't know who did it, but somebody called the Memphis office and said, this man's making claims for yellow root that it will cure stomach ulcers and cure cancer. lady from the Memphis office came down. She said, Mr. Bass, we heard this uh, rumor that you're claiming that yellow root will cure stomach ulcers. And he looked at her and he said, why, yes, ma'am, it will. It'll kill them graveyard dead. And she said, you can't say that. That's a new claim. He said, well, ma'am, I've been doing this for 77 years, and it'll kill a graveyard dead. She never came back. They dropped it. You know, it's an old guy doing this stuff. <clears throat> Didn't hurt anything. Three years later, Dr. James Duke comes along. Grew up in Birmingham. His job, and knew Tommy, where his job was working with, with the government looking for medicinal plants for the government to study. And he said, wait a minute. What causes stomach ulcers? You used to think it was drinking and all that. That can play a factor, but 90, 85, 90 percent of all stomach ulcers are caused by the H. pylori bacteria, Helicobacter pylori bacteria. And in government testing, there was a chemical that actually killed that bacteria. Guess what? It's called berberine. Therefore, yellow root would cure a stomach ulcer. Tommy didn't know what berberine was till the day he died, but he knew from eight, you know by the time he died, 81 years of doing it, his grandparents doing it. You know, and everybody in the South, knowing yellow root, that it would cure stomach ulcer, and it would cure stomach ulcer. It would knock out a mouth ulcer, canker sore. Wonderful liver herb. Great for, for, for liver and gallbladder derangements. Good for any, it goes in the salve I'm going to give away because it really helps keep wounds from being infected and to heal. Excellent, excellent stuff. And believe it or not, it makes really good wine. It's bitter. You'd think it'd be bitter, but it's actually sweet. Makes, I haven't tried mead with it yet. Excellent plant to use, and we'll let this one go. You stick this on a shady creek bank, and it'll slowly take off. And they can actually get that high on occasion, but this is about, about average. Real pretty plant. Um, there was an herb doctor in Gadsden named Doc, I think it was Doc Enoch, that one, that had a stomach ulcer cure that people from several states around in the early 70s would come fly in just to get a stomach ulcer cure. And all it was was he would buy yellow root and golden seal from Tommy, grind them up, mix it with mayonnaise. That was the critical ingredient. And the reason it was critical was because it got that nasty tasting bitter stuff down your throat before you realized how nasty bitter tasting it was. But people swore by it where they would actually get plane tickets just to come get that remedy. And that's all it was, was ground up yellow root, golden seal with the berberine content, a little mayonnaise to oil it on down the gullet, and you're good to go. I have seen this in some of my salves, the bass in particular, take wounds to the bone and heal them. Okay. We'll go to a, a fungus now. How many of you are familiar with chaga? Pretty good. How many of you have ever had syrup made from chaga other than within the last few hours? <laughs> Did you like it? Yeah. Pretty good, isn't it? You would not think that this would taste good. It grows on yellow birch trees down here. If you can find a white birch, that's the main one up north that it grows on. And down here you have to be up in the mountains to find yellow birch. And then it's cool enough to let this stuff grow. This is one of my favorite medicinal fungi. Wait a minute. Anybody the FDA, law enforcement, blah, blah, here? Okay. Anyway, when I work with people with cancer, this is one that all go on. Because it is a, what you call a broad-spectrum anti-cancer herb. If you're familiar with the Russian dissident writer and doctor, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he wrote the Gulag Archipelago, and he also wrote one called, and I swear I can't, I've got a mind block on the name, it's either Cancer Ward or Cancer Doctor. Cancer Ward, I think. But what happened was every few years, the Soviets would ship him off to Siberia to shut him up. And then they'd finally let him come, him come back because of his fame. 
And they didn't put these prisoners, these political prisoners, in, in prison cells. They put them in prison camps. Siberia was your prison. I mean, you were 10,000 miles from nowhere. If you got out, the villagers would hunt you down and kill you for the bounty. So you were stuck. So they had these huge prison camps of 30, 40, 50,000 men. When you've got a prison camp of 30, 40,000, 50 men, what do you have? A city. And you have every disease that pops up in a city that size. So he had had a bout with cancer and went into the village to look for black market medicine for cancer and could not find anybody with cancer. He said it was so low statistically as to almost be non-existent. And he got to thinking, well, what in the world are they all doing the same? And as a former teacher, and he, I like the fact that he did not have to grow up using common core math. They used regular math and came up with, well, two and two does make four, and what are they doing the same? 10,000 miles from nowhere, you couldn't get coffee unless you were rich or the prison you know, commander. So all of the people in, in the, the Soviet system that were not in prison were drinking this beverage just like the natives did as a hot coffee substitute. And it's, you know, you know you can, if you're not a coffee connoisseur, you can convince yourself it's coffee tasting, and it's, and it's a good substitute. And it was that water decoction was keeping them from getting cancer. So eventually it became a prescription medicine for cancer in the Soviet Union. And so what I do with this is I make a double extract, which is alcohol and water-based, because some of the chemicals are alcohol-soluble, some are water-soluble, and then you combine the two. And it causes a couple of things to happen. First off, it has a thing called apoptosis. Apoptosis means every cell in your body is programmed to die at some point in time. It doesn't live forever, and it's replaced. Cancer cells are just another living cell. They are programmed eventually. They die. They're replaced with more cancerous cells. This speeds up the process of cancerous cells. It does not touch a healthy cell. There is absolutely no side effect. Well, the only potential side effect to this is it also helps regulate blood sugar levels, but I've never heard of any problems with it. But it causes those cells that are cancerous to speed up and die and not be replaced. It also has what's called an anti-angiogenesis effect. Anti against angios, the vessels. Genesis beginning. It shrinks and shrivels up those blood vessels leading to the cancer cells. And just like any living cell, cancer cells need water, they need food, they need nutrition or they die. And this shuts off, does not touch healthy cells. And it's full of different chemicals. It's got what's called superoxide dismutase, all the terpenes, beta-glucans, um, betulinic acid, Wonderful. So, by the way, birch trees themselves are very good for cancer from the betulinic acid in it. Now, I'm going to hand this to you, but I want you to realize something. I can run faster than you. I want this one back. <laughs> this is really hard to get for me. But it's good. But when we make these, these pancakes, we're going to actually use some chaga syrup on it that, you, that I think you'll like. Another mushroom that I... And I use the term loosely because it's technically a fungus, not a mushroom, but we call them all them mushrooms. And you should be fairly familiar with this. Hen of the woods, also called maitake. In Japan, it was known as one of the laughing mushrooms because it was so rare, so expensive, that if a peasant found it, you laugh because it was worth its weight in silver. This is an excellent for regulating blood sugar levels. It's an immunomodulator. And what that means is it resets your immune system so that your body's not fighting against itself, it fights against what's going wrong with your immune system. For example, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you don't use things like elderberry. Elderberry is an immune stimulant. It'll make it worse if you use too much of it. You can use things like echinacea, which people think are, is an immune stimulant, and it's actually an immunomodulator that the government recognizes for the treatment of, of Ebola. They recognize it as an immunomodulator, but there's a lot of mythology surrounding it. But most of these medicinal mushrooms, not all, but most of them are actually immunomodulators. They'll give you a strong immune system if you need it. They will dampen it down to where it needs to be if it's too strong in fighting your body. You know, grab that. Pass those around. Grows at the base of white oak trees, mainly. No, that's hen of the woods. Chicken of the woods is orange and yellow. And it tastes like chicken. It's great. It's an antibiotic. It is not an immunomodulator per se. 
but it's really good to eat. Much more common than hen of the woods. Hen of the woods, you've got to find a big old white oak, look at the base of it. This morning, we found it on that huge white oak stump that had been cut. And so I said, I wish I'd been here a week ago because I would like to have gotten it. They're hard to find in Alabama, not real, real common. But it's an excellent medicinal mushroom, one of the best eating fungi that you'll ever have. I love it better than morels by a long shot. Excellent to, to cook with. You can actually take it, powder it, use it as soup stock. And a lot of people will, will take the, the petals. That's what they eat. But if you take that big, thick core that everybody throws out, you can actually either dry it and powder it and use it for soup stock or slice it real thin and make beef jerky. And it tastes like beef jerky. Again, I do a double extract when I'm making medicine with it. This right here is wild ginger. Now, you have two families that wild ginger comes in. One is a serum, one is hexastylus. This is hexastylus. I think it tastes better than the official wild ginger. Very good medicine. It works in the same way that you use commercial ginger for it, for nausea. It heats the body from the core out. It's a good liver herb, good heart medication, many, many things. The root smells wonderful. That's where you think, ooh, root beer. I, you can take this and make syrup with it, then thicken that syrup and use it as a glaze on ham and step back. As they say in South, slap your mama. It is that, that good. In fact, I've got class next weekend. I'm going to teach them how to make, um, what are we going to make? Uh, shag bark hickory balls and uh, hard candies with wild ginger. Yeah, it's really good, great antiviral, by the way. Don't give this to young kids who can't control their core body temperature or somebody who's old and frail because it'll cause seizures because they can't stand that body heating up. And little kids especially, they'll, they'll have what are called febrile seizures. And I don't know what the technical term is for old folk seizures. I always call them geriatric seizures. And somebody, you can have somebody 80 years old that can do a good diaphoretic and sweat, no problem. But then you may have somebody 65 that's been in bad health for a long time they're frail, they're weak, and you give them any diaphoretic herb, and it'll make them have seizures, potentially. <clears throat> and the last plant up here, sort of speaking, is wild yam. This is the family where the original birth control pills came from. But what is so neat about this is in the 1800s, they had a condition called bilious colic. Now, tell me what that was. They thought it was severe cramping of the intestines arising out of the liver and gallbladder. Nowadays, we call that irritable bowel syndrome. But they did have irritable bowel syndrome back then. They just called it bilious colic. And they used the root or the rhizome of this for bilious colic. It acts in as, as an antihistamine to the intestinal tract. You take a, a tablespoon of this to about a cup of water, boil it, and then take a spoonful every couple of hours, and in two or three hours, it just not some usually sooner than that, it just knocks the spasming out completely. It makes a slimy, reddish looking liquid, and it's extremely effective, works really well. Now, Tommy Bass knew it even more so as an anti inflammatory for arthritis, which is a, a interesting thing and that's what it does it works really well for arthritis but nobody ever uses it for that and I use it in some of my, my formulas for that and it works works well all right one of the things I wanted to make for y'all today is let you tr what time is it by the way anybody so I'm about on time okay is uh, some pancakes but first I want to give a jar of salve away this is a salve that Tommy Bass made for 81 years it, his great-grandparents actually developed this in England in probably 1850s, 1860s. Eczema, psoriasis, skin cancers, wounds that don't want to heal, you name it. I was sitting in a meeting with a friend of mine. He was about 75. Interesting guy. He was from England, but he was born in Pakistan back when England owned Pakistan. And he was sitting there with shorts, black socks, and flip-flops or sandals. Now, I do not swing that way but I was looking at his legs. And my thought running through my mind was, oh, God, please don't let me dress that way when I hit 75. <laughs> but I noticed on his ankle, right about here, was a wound about six inches long to the bone. You could actually see the bone. It was oozing and weeping and nasty looking. And I said, Mike, what's wrong with your ankle? And he explained that he had had a steel rod taken out. I don't know if his car wreck or he fell or whatever. 
And his doctor in North Alabama is regionally known as a very well-known wound care specialist. They tried hyperbaric chambers, debridement, antibiotics, nothing was healing this. It was not closing at all. And I don't know what their next step would have been. And uh, I said, I'll tell you what, I got a skin salve I make. I didn't know of Tommy Bass from living there. I said, you promised me three times a day, see you next week. Saw him next week at the meeting. Shorts, black socks, flip-flops. I was thinking, oh, Lord, please don't let me. Oh, anyway. And I asked him, I said, Mike, how's your ankle doing? Big old owl eyes. And he said, you're not going to believe this. And it was halfway closed. Three weeks later, it was, it was gone. Three weeks later, he took it to his doctor and said, what you do? He said, what did you do to your ankle to make it heal? And he got some of the salve to try. We, uh, I saw a lot of this under the table to nursing homes for bed sores. <laughs> and because... Let me ask you something. Um, I've got uh, diabetic ulcers on the bottom. Mm -hmm. the that would be one to try it on. I don't want to heal. Right. That would be one I would try. I'll let you try some. Okay. Let me... Go. I better not close my eyes. Do, 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 do. And the winner is Emily Popa. Papa. That would be you. You're welcome. And of course, that was a sneaky advertising. I got plenty over there. Anyway, one of the things when it comes to doing wild foods, I said, is it needs to be able to be tasty by itself or be made to taste tasty, right? Well, one of the plants, and also provide more calories than are spent harvesting it. One of the plants that you have that grows all over the place here, I saw some 10 o'clock last night in the headlights driving through, is yellow dock. It's also called curly dock. The root, and actually it's in that skin salve too because of its ability to heal wounds. Very high in iron. In fact, farmers in the 1800s would put old horseshoes and nails around it the year before they dug it so that it would absorb the, the iron as it leached out to make it even better and then they would use it for medicine. Tommy Bass's first meal in like 1912 when he moved in that area, they stopped on the side of a creek and had some fat back with yellow dock leaves as a green. So you think of it like spinach or turnip greens. It's actually in the wintertime, in the early spring, it's quite tasty, it's not bitter at all. But anyway, in the late spring, early summer, it sends up a stalk about so high, sort of greenish looking seed cases on it that turn brown. And once they turn brown, you'll see fields of these brown stalks standing up. This plant is actually in the, uh, not bones, at the, uh, um, shoo, where'd that go? Uh, buckwheat family. Let me start with a B. It's a member of the buckwheat family. So when you make, you take those seeds and harvest them and make pancakes or crackers or bread, it tastes like buckwheat pancakes. And the nice thing I like about it is the speed at which you can harvest this. I've harvested 30 gallons a, a couple of months ago and it took me an hour and 10 minutes to snap the stalks, throw them in the back of the truck, drive home and strip them off. And I got 30 gallons of seed and you use the husk, everything, you grind it all up together. And so if you, you look at it first, y'all can pass that around. That's what it looks like stripped off. And I won't pass it. And then I just put it in my Vitamix and just grind it down as needed. There are no oils in it, so you can just leave it all year and it won't go rancid like acorn flour will. And so you use this about a third of your mix when you're making pancakes, waffles, able, you know, anybody ever make able skivers? Ooh, aren't those good? And I, I, make, I like them in able skivers. So what I did was I did some foraging on the way up. And in, in the mountains of southern Tennessee, I went to the buttermilk complete pancake tree. carved out some wooden plates, dug for oil, and oh, and there's the hand-carved spatula from Spatula City. Anyway, you know, we do have one little challenge. I don't have a bowl. Let me see what we're going to do. How clean is this bucket? <laughs> have we got a bowl or something somewhere? that we could use. I knew I was missing something. Um, always a solution. I've got a bowl right here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Okay. And I blew a glass bowl. So now, when you make this, you do about a third of the mix you do with your yellow dock. No gluten in it, so it won't rise. If you do too much, it'll be too heavy. So I like the Galloping Gourmet. Remember him? Yeah, you, you eyeball it. So we're going to do about two cups of flour. You can make your own self-rising mix, or this is dollar. <clears throat> do y'all have Dollar General up here? Yeah. Okay, Dollar General. This is where this came from, down in Alabama. We just we just eyeball it. Uh, somebody's gonna need to get me a little like a thing of water. Do 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 do. Hmm. Yeah. My wife has banished me from the kitchen. So we'll go we'll go with that. Then we'll do about a third. And somebody can have this if y'all want it. I got plenty. We'll do about a third. Yes, please. It may take two. We may have to fill it up again. Yeah. See, now if it's galloping gourmet, it'd be a bottle of wine going. Okay, thank you. Because you can always add more flour. Turn down. And mix. Now, what we're going to do once we get to a certain point is we're going to add a secreting. Well, that was really good guesstimating. is we're going to add a secret ingredient, which will no longer be secret. All right, yeah, did y'all go up to the people doing the shag bark hickory syrup up the booth? Okay, I made that for you. This is sh uh, oh, it's actually shag bark hickory nut syrup that we'll put into the mix. And it is delicious. And to make this, you actually chop up, not chop, you grind up the nuts, shell and all, and you boil them all, shell and all. Then you strain it out. And this adds a lot of flavor. You can add, add the chaga syrup to it. Now I'll have to do a little bit more flour to get thicken that up. This green of the leaves, if you eat the leaves, is as nutritious or more nutritious than any garden leafy green that you'll have. Very good dark leafy green vegetable. Now, there's also another one out there called broadleaf dock, but it's also known as bitter dock. And the seeds look sort of similar, but if you don't winnow the seeds out of the chaff, it'll be bitter. And if you eat the leaves, you can boil them, throw the water off a couple times like you do pokes at it, it'll still be bitter. So people will talk about, you got to winnow the seeds out or you can't use, have been using bitter dock, not curly dock. Well, that'll work. Oh, thank you. I'd already forgotten about it. You should have kept it. <laughs> anyway. Now you, all, you know how you test a griddle? Ooh, ow, that's hot. So, oh yeah, this was the hardest thing to make. Okay, look. See how nice and brown they are? Now I'll make I'll make all this and y'all can get you some and use some of this chaga syrup that's got kudzu blossoms in it. By the way, did you know that kudzu leaves are about 24 to 28% protein. In the spring, if you take the young leaves when they're, they're shiny and not hairy, cook them up in uh, scrambled eggs, really, really good. As they get older 
and get hairy and not quite so much fun to cook with, I take them, dehydrate them, powder them up, and then make vegetable bouillon cubes out of the powder. Really, really good. And extremely nutritious. You, it's, it's higher in protein than alfalfa. So it's real good for feeding rabbits, etc. I'm going to set these down here. And by the way, any questions? You understand everything? The syrup is, was hickory nut syrup. Oh, the yellow dock seed. Just ground up husk and all. That's, can't get any simpler than that. Uh, let me do, I'll, I don't have it with me, it's over there, but I'll give away another salve. Mayor Fox, Mark Fox, Mary Fox. Okay, you can help yourself over here. <coughs> the jar of salve. You can have a, you've won one. So, let's try these. Yeah, my wife came home one night, and here's what I was doing in the kitchen sink. Flour makes a really good concrete. She came home one night because she teaches uh, yoga at the gym and I had one thing, I waited, I waited, you know, I waited till she goes and, and do things and clean up real good and I left one little bottle on the counter. She walked in, she said, what's that? I said, what? That bottle. What's it doing there? And I thought for a split second, then I decided honesty is the best policy. I said, but I cleaned up. Okay. That's going to take a few more minutes. In fact, it's not. All right. It would help if the heat would stay on. Okay. Anyway, any other questions? We'll slow this thing down. Yes. For what? For identifying wild plants? For making medicines out of them? Making foods or what? Okay. If you're looking at wild foods, two good authors to look for are Samuel Thayer. T-H-A-Y-E-R. He's up in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, there is somewhere. Really good writer, does very detailed books. He's got The Forager's Harvest and a couple of other books that are excellent. From out west, Dr. John Callas, K-A-L-L-A-S, is really good. He, and he'll have a few things that grow out west. We don't have like miners, lettuce and stuff, but, but a lot of it's the same. And then I've, if you go to my YouTube channel, I've got about 40 videos on, on plant hikes and talking about medicinal plants and edible plants. What was the subject? John Callas, K-A-L-L-A-S, Dr. John Callas. He's got one or two books out that I know of. Uh, I, can't think of I can't think of the names of them. And then uh, Samuel Fair's got two or three out right now that are very, very well done. Uh... I don't know, that's the last one over there today. It's normally $35. If you order it off my website, it's $40 because of shipping. Uh, any, and plus, if you, get my, if you get my card, contact me. If you got a plant you want ID, just text it to me. I get about 10 or 15 texts a day. I say, what is this? Well, if you wouldn't take it up like that, I might could tell you. And uh, I don't, that's what I do, so I don't mind a bit doing it. Uh, if you're ever interested in... Classes, I do classes from Florida to Virginia, I mean to, uh, obviously Virginia, to uh, Michigan. Usually weekend classes where I teach all day, both days. I'm going to try that and see if that will work. Yeah, it's getting there. Okay, I'm not, my heat's not sticking on this thing. Something's... Well, well, it was a good thought, but the power there. We, wait a minute. Let's do it this way. For some reason it is not staying up there. Now we're cooking with gas. Okay. 
So when it comes to, to the, the, the plants, you know, start with a few things. Slowly incorporate them into your diet, and that way you don't overload yourself, or slowly incorporate the medicinal plants. You know, I know four or 5,000 plants that I go out and make medicine from, but in reality, if you learn about 30, you can cover a whole wide range of things. And if you look at it, well, you need to decide, what are you wanting to work with? If you're a mother and got young kids, you want to help your kids. Elderly parents, you're in you know, a certain stage of life, you may be, have family members dealing with cancer or this or that. So you start looking at what are the things that I deal with now or am likely to deal with. And that will help you decide which way to go. In my, cl okay. in my class, I've got about 20 students right now, and they all have different goals. Some want to be herbalists. Some like the social aspect of get out of hiking, digging herbs, and some want just enough knowledge to treat their family. Now, if you got to go while we're waiting on these to cook, and they're starting to cook now, is you can take a taste of this. This is that, th where'd it go? My fungus, chaga, and I mix kudzu blossoms, which taste like grape, in with it. And pour a little on your finger and taste that. Otherwise, wait on a pancake and you pour it on the pancake. Because it's good. And I've got one more bottle in the truck if you, if you want it and some more of the other syrup as well. There we go. I see steam. Oh, yeah. And you can take wild hickory nuts and black walnuts and throw in the mix. Never hurts. Okay. I'll cut these in half and that'll, get, that'll start getting everybody some. And I started doing this in 1984, so going on 32 years. And I still go to the woods and I'm excited about it because it's a never-ending source of new learning, new plants, new uses for the same plants I've known for years. So it's, it's something once you start it, uh, Tommy told the story once, he said, it's like this man he went up to a friend's house and there's this mama dog, had puppies. She came running up to him, was going to bite him, so he grabbed her by the ears. And then he said, I didn't know what to do, I didn't know whether to, to hold on or let go. He said, I never did let go, I guess, so I stayed working with herbs for 81 years. So I guess I'm getting on up there now. I was talking to my wife one day, and I said, you know, I was at, a, I was at this workshop, some lady, you know, that old lady you know? And she said, you know, she's probably your age. And I thought, hmm, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Let me change what I say. Because you'd never know I was 82 years old this year. No, I'm not. I'm, I, I just turned 60. But bye, George. Old age will have to catch me from behind. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you want to try one, we'll, I'm ready to serve some up. And I promise not to poison you. Besides, I got insurance. Do, 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 do. Okay, and there's the, you know, get those. Tell you what, I'm just gonna, before I burn them all, let me, let me have a plate and y'all can divide them up that way. Now that it's cooking, it's hot, hot, hot. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? it looks right. And if I'd, I had a time to find a wild buffalo or deer, I'd make you some butter. But and... yeah, you can probably just tear them into halves. Man, these will cook fast because it's hot griddle. Making some pancakes with a yellow dock.
Okay. Give me, I tell you what. Let's do it this way. We were kind of cutting it in quarters over. Scissors would have worked real well here. Okay, here's some more if y'all want to pass those around yeah, yeah. and get a plate. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, tell you what, would you? Right, I don't know where the syrup went. Somebody oh, yeah, it. snatched it. Okay. Ten dollars. Hmm. Yeah, uh, if there's not one on the table, yeah, there should be. There's a box underneath there. It's got them. I'm got. I got eight more coming. Well, anyway, thank you for coming. the corner with this gold in it. Okay. Has anybody tried it yet? Like it pretty good, isn't it? Okay, anybody want the yellow dock powder? Well, you, huh? That's what's in the pancakes. Uh, get a, If you get a baggie or something, well, I'll tell you what. Y'all can split that one up. You have to grind it yourself. Okay. And this one. And actually, you can use it unground. Y'all, well, y'all split it. If you can find some containers, put it in. I still got about 28 gallons of this left, so I'm good. From that hickory nut, it smells almost fruity. It's got a really good odor to it. Now, if you really want to get exotic when it comes to herbal medicine, I use a lot of non-traditional, well, they are traditional, but I use beaver casters, from, which is a, a scent gland from beavers that is one of the most powerful nervings, calm me down. Uh, I've, I've spent the last two months harvesting spider webs on a stick because it, it, it's a, a mood elevator. I uh, make bee venoms uh, out of honeybees. But you'd be surprised how many modern medicines are made out of bugs. Your big flu vaccine everybody's taking right now, uh, one form of it's made out of uh, uh, army worms. Those green caterpillar army worms, that, they, they grow them in that. So you're, eating, you're using bug stuff in your flu vaccine. And if you use lipstick and rouge and all sorts of stuff, you're getting insect blood, cochin cochineal in you. But it's another good medicine too. Real pretty. You've got to be careful not to spill it though. All right, give that just one more minute and this will be done. That one's done. There you go. It used to be called Carmine Red. Well, it is all natural. It's made out of bug blood, natural bug blood. No, no. Typically, they would harvest uh, commercially uh, in the cellar black spiders, but any spider web works. So I go every time I go somewhere, I see a spider web. I give them a chance to run, and then I because they rebuild it every day anyway. There you go. There's some more. It does. You can make a take the tincture, and it's like, Ooh, I feel bitter. You make tincture out of uh, spider web. Mhm. Mm it's called Tela, T-E-L-A, or Tela, either one. Yeah. You'd be you'd be surprised though. You ever heard of Primarin for women for 
Yeah, some of you are familiar with it. Primarin, pregnant Mary urine. That's where it's made. That's why it's called Primarin. Look under the table, there's a flat box. A bunch of it under the table. Uh huh. Ten. Ten dollars. Huh? Better. <laughs> I don't trust anybody over there. They look a little skeezy. Uh, the, the, I don't see it no more. Somebody get it? Oh, it's the last one I've got. If you want, it's 35 bucks. 35. It's the only one left. That's all I brought. Is this enough for everybody? Okay, well, I'll, I'll make one more batch. If, let me just make it. I got the stuff. I don't want to, anybody not to get some. No, with the yellow dock seed. Wild pancakes. Does it work with curly dock, too? Curly dock is yellow dock. That's what I thought. Same thing. Just two different names for the same plant. Mm -hmm. It's the broad leaf or bitter dock, and you can see it because it's got a wide leaf with a red mid vein that'll develop. That's the one that if you use the seeds, you can, but you have to winnow that chaff off because that's what's, what's bitter. With the curly dock slash yellow dock, I grind everything up together, chaff and all, and it gives you roughage. Oh, yeah. I picked 30 gallons out of one field, didn't touch it all. The salve? Yes. Oh, okay. That'd make it easier. This makes really good uh, cake. Oh, yeah. Tommy had a case, two cases actually, where doctors in the 1930s sent children to him with eczema so bad from head to toe that they said, if you, don't, if you can't do something, they're going to die. And they survived. You always use it on a small area first, make sure no sensitivities, and then just keep a thin coat several times a day. Okay, I got eight more going if anybody wants them. Well, you're welcome. I hope you like it. Oh, if anybody wants to try some straight hickory nut syrup, there's a little bit in there. Try that. Put that on the pancake. That's hickory nut syrup. That's in the batter, but that wouldn't hurt to put some on there. And that's the chaga syrup. I'm sorry, do what? That's the chaga. And you take the, the mushroom itself, the fungus rather, and boil it in, until it makes coffee. Yeah, you don't use it. So, one. Oh, okay. Um, and you just boil it. And actually, when it's done, you can dry it and boil it about five or six more times and keep using it until it finally quits giving up its color and flavor. And you're still good to go. I'll go online. Just don't fall for the Siberian chaga thing because it's pure and it's the wild, it's the best. It's chaga's chaga, wherever it comes from. And don't get chaga that's been cleaned where they take that black crust off. That's where a lot of the medicinal value actually is. So if you take that off, you're, you're not getting really what you need. You're getting less lesser quality. Um, $12 to $20 a pound is fair price. Just throw in some water and boil it. As I say down in Alabama, boil the hound out of it and until it's as dark as you like your coffee. And then add whatever sweetener you use, and you're done. Mm -hmm. Now, I make a double extract when I do medicine because I pull out water-soluble and alcohol-soluble chemicals. But as a general beverage, you just boil it. And if you're just going to use it as a general anti-cancer thing or a maintenance, you can just make tea out of it and drink the tea every day. But if somebody's got an active case of cancer, I would do the, my double extracts. If they want to try it, uh, all they got to do is contact me, and I don't charge for my services for people with cancer. And I'll ship it to them free. Got my cards on the table over there. On the table. <laughs> Sorry. No, I get it. I got to clean up here anyway. Uh, a plant called winter huckleberry. 
also called Sparkleberry, Farkleberry. Uh, I've, that, I use it for that and sugar issues, really, really effective. Made, it's just made into a tea, into a decoction. It's, it's, to me, it smells like boiled cabbage when it's done, but, you know, and I don't like that, but it's boiled cabbage. But it's very, very faintly a boiled cabbage, which, winter huckleberry. Look up, it's vaccinian arborescence, or arborins, and um, it's a pretty big size hickory, I mean a huckleberry. The berries get ripe in the fall. No, you're using the branches, but that's when, that's when you can harvest the, the fruit, is in the fall, that's when they get ripe instead of in the spring and summer. Huh? Vaccinium arborescens or arborens, one or the other. But if you look up winter huckleberry or sparkleberry, vaccinium, just a vaccinium, V-A-C-C-I-N-I-U-M, and then put uh, tree huckleberry or sparkleberry, it'll, it'll come up. All right, now I cooked a slaved over a hot griddle now. I need to eat these. These are the nice fresh. These are the nice fresh ones too. Huh? Good, isn't it? Oh, uh, I didn't give these away. First come, first serve. Well, is there no? Because everybody's scattered. If y'all want it, fight over it. This way, I don't have to take it back. Now, the yellow root looks a little puny. This one's real healthy. These are not so much, but they'll come back. <clears throat> a lot of it is, yeah. What's that for? Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, if you go to my website, get my card, go to my website, it's under the store, resources. I think resources, store, and it's, and it's there. Yeah, just go to thesouthernherbalist.com. You're welcome. Hope you enjoyed it.